Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. What a great pleasure it is to have this opportunity to uh, share the, the work that was uh, completed over the last uh, year or so. Um, I'm going to just talk to you in, in five parts uh, briefly, because we only have 10 minutes uh, together. And I'm going to cover uh, about this guide, why we have this guide, the basis of this guide, and what the guide does and where to find it, most importantly. So first of all, about this guide, um, it was actually published in its first uh, form uh, back in 2009. And uh, we took the decision that uh, it was now time to, um, to review that, that guide and uh, look to uh, refresh it. And I chaired, on behalf of the Engineering Council Board, a working group which was established in November 2019. And I just want to acknowledge at this point, um, big thanks to um, uh, Deborah Seddon, who uh, works for the Engineering Council and, uh, and provide the secretariat for the working group. And then uh, we were joined by uh, Adisa as a Pagic from Manchester University, Katie Creswell Maynard from Engineers Without Borders, uh, Clara Bagnell George uh, from Elementor Consulting, Graham Thelwell from uh, Swansea University, and uh, Sarah Kassem from Sibsi. And it was a real pleasure to work with such a knowledgeable uh, group of people who are so committed to what we were trying to achieve. And the guidance was uh, eventually published uh, in January of this year, 2021. Now, the document uh, itself has uh, two purposes, really. One is supporting engineers and technicians in their practice. And secondly, to provide a resource, a material for the professional engineering institutions and professional affiliates from which to tailor and build upon when developing uh, their own materials for their membership um, and sector. And we'll hear a bit more about that um, in the, with the uh, next speakers. Overall, our approach to reviewing the document uh, was that the working group, first of all, re reviewed the existing document. We then consulted with the professional engineering um, institution community on the draft. And ultimately, the document was signed off by the Registration Standards Committee and the Privy Council and Governance Panel. So why this guide? Well, for me, it's actually a coalesce, coalescing of two things. First of all, we are in the midst of a climate and ecological emergencies, and we're not moving at anything like the pace an emergency would suggest is needed. Now, the UK Climate Change uh, Committee just recently in December published its sixth carbon budget report, and they reviewed the UK's trajectory to net zero by 2050 and concluded that we really do need to pick up the pace. In fact, they concluded that we need to cut carbon emissions by 78% by 2035, which effectively brings that target forward by 15 years. So it's an immense challenge. I think it's also worth noting as well that the low carbon investment um, required must scale up to 50 billion pounds a year. So there's a massive amount of work to be done here, just evidenced by that, um, that figure. So that's the first thing. The second thing that coalesces, coalesces so well is that engineers have got the knowledge and the skills to meet these challenges. And I think if, if you take the engineering sector as a whole, I don't think any other profession comes near to having the ability we have to mitigate climate change and to adapt and build resilience to the change that has happened and will continue to happen to some extent. I think a further imperative for us as a profession is that we need to attract the best talent. And increasingly, people are making career choices based upon purpose, especially in relation to our environment. Now, many of our practices in engineering have been and still are harmful and not sustainable. And we must acknowledge this and address this, as well as demonstrate that we have the solutions. Other drivers, of course, for us are that as an engineering council, we have a requirement uh, and sorry, as professional engineers, we have a requirement uh, in the UK standard for professional engineering competence, UK spec, that professional engineers work sustainably. 
And there's an ethical uh, angle here as well, in that our ethical principles require us to respect the environment. So I hope that sets the stage well and, and firmly for why we need this guidance. Now, the basis of the guidance is that it's uh, an introduction uh, and aims to encourage sustainable thinking. And I think that's a really important message. If you take nothing else away from this afternoon than that, that this guidance is there to encourage sustainable thinking. It also importantly applies to all sectors of engineering. It's founded upon a definition of sustainability. And after much discussion, the group decided that we were going to stick with the UN Commission Brundtland Report definition of 1987, which says sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And we felt it was really important, that last part of the statement there, that this that we recognise the rights of future generations, their right to achieve a sustainable level of development and their right to be able to utilise natural resources, but responsibly. And we certainly wanted to avoid any suggestion that lesser developed countries should be curtailed in their ability to grow or to make judgments over things like population growth. Sustainable development must also meet the challenge of cl the climate emergency by reducing energy and resource consumption to within limits set out by science-based targets. And that's a, a, a strong feature in the guidance. Other global challenges that we seek to encourage thinking around are urgent uh, action on the depletion of resources, environmental pollution, increased consumption and damage to ecosystems, including loss of biodiversity. And most importantly, we're seeking to promote thinking around achievement of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and in particular, the interconnections that exist between all 17 of those goals. So as I get towards my conclusion, I just will share with you what the guidance does. Um, it's structured in six against six principles. The first of those is to contribute to building a sustainable society. The next is to apply professional and responsible judgment and take a leadership role. I think right there in that, that, that sentence is the essence of being a professional registered engineer. It has a uh, next section, um, third section is about encouraging us to do more than just comply, to really challenge the status quo. We're not going to accelerate our net zero ambitions um, as a country or indeed as a world without challenging the status quo. The fourth part of the guidance is around using resources efficiently and effectively. The fifth part of the guidance is that we are encouraging the seeking of multiple views. And I think all of us in the engineering profession will very much recognise that over the last few decades, we're increasingly working in multidisciplinary teams. We value multidisciplinary perspectives. We're good at working in multidisciplinary teams. But uh, the guidance provides a little more um, around how we can seek those multiple views. And the final section is about minimising adverse impact and maximising benefit to people and the environment. Now, the important thing to note here again is that this guidance is to be used alongside related information from the professional uh, engineering institutions. And uh, Julie and Clara are going to uh, share some of that experience with us um, shortly. My overall strap line here is that this is all about leadership and placing engineers as leaders, we have a unique opportunity in many ways in, the, in, in how we uh, interact and operate at uh, project level on large global projects all around the world. And uh, I think that leadership, taking a stand and showing the way is um, something that uh, the profession really needs to, to take seriously and to do. So finally, just to, to wrap up, where can you find all of this? Um, the Engineering Council website is your main answer to that. Uh, there's an online resource there. There's also a downloadable leaflet and there are a guidance wallet cards, uh, six cards around the six principles that I've just um, outlined to you.
The website also very usefully includes links to other sort of related resources, and that's being updated all the time. So that's the place to go to um, to, to find the guidance and uh, and uh, start making good good use of it. So that is uh, where I'm going to leave it. Um, Chris, thank you very much, and uh, obviously look forward to any questions later on.